So, um, as you heard, um, um, robotics will help, is already helping space exploration. Um, and I will speak how another kind of exploration, exploration of our brain, will help to develop, in addition to understanding ourselves, will help to develop in more intelligent machines and more intelligent robots. But before that, since I'm the last speaker in the panel, I would like to connect um, uh, our, our session back to the main obvious message of this afternoon, which is um, simply that uh, basic research Curiosity-driven basic research is quite important. Uh, many non-scientists may think that um, basic research that th th you heard about, um, even if done with scientific tools, is a bit like uh, rock climbing or ski skiing, uh, which is you know, a, a very human activity, but economically, uh, from the point of view of economists, not very relevant. Now, I disagree, and I'll tell you a little story about this. 11 years ago, actually, uh, let's see, 13 years ago, I went to Pavia, uh, to a, one of these old universities cities in Italy, almost as old as uh, Bologna and the Sorbonne, to get a laurea honoris causa. And the, uh, the event was because it was the bicentennial of the invention of the PILA, the battery, by Alessandro Volta who published the paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in 1800. Now, you have to imagine um, you know, the time. There was a museum that just opened then uh, to describe how the times of Volta were and the impact of the invention on the society at that time. Um, you know, it was, the discovery was really an exercise in curiosity-driven research, mainly motivated by the fact that Galvani, a competitor, a neuroscientist, an anatomist in Padua uh, claimed uh, something about animal electricity. And, uh, and Volta, as a consequence, invented the pillar to prove that Gal Galvani was wrong. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the invention allowed for the first time in history to produce electricity four times longer than a microsecond a spark. So, in fact, the original pillar provide, I think, 2.1 volts, I have a copy at home, for about 2.5 minutes or so, okay? And then, after that, uh, it was possible for scientists to study electricity. And, um, you know, 1800, uh, this was uh, Napoleon, in fact, Volta was made Count, Count Volta by Napoleon for his invention. And until then, the speed of information in the world traveled really at the speed of a horse. In 1450, when Constantinople fell to the Turks, this was the year more or less that Columbus was born in Genoa, from Genoa. Um, at the time, the news of the fall of Constantinople reached Vienna uh, three weeks after the fact. Paris, four weeks, Madrid, five weeks. And so the speed of information remained the same and until Volta uh, was the uh, horse uh, traveling 24 hours a day. And uh, after Volta, 10 years, 20 years later, there were telegraph lines, and then there was uh, Hertz, Maxwell and Hertz, and uh, you know, radio and so on in a few decades. Everything happened, including chemistry and electrical generators and so on. So, this is probably, um, you know, one of the first examples, I assume the first example, that even professors can have an impact on real life. I was a professor <laughs> in, in Padilla. So, um, the, mes the message of the panel is, of course, that many of all of our progress as a society come from our technologies, and many of them, um, in, I think indirectly, most of them, come from basic research. And, and my specific message right now is that an important, uh, in this century, an important part of basic research will be in neuroscience. 
And, um, and before I start mentioning real neuroscience, I have to say what it means to understand, the, to understand the, um, something like the brain. Um, but let me first say that I think understanding the brain and uh, uh, the product of the brain, which is the mind, is intelligence, is a core question for all sciences. And the reason I'm biased personally I, uh, is the following. Is, um, when I was a kid, I was fascinated by, by the theory of relativity, by the fact that Einstein, with uh, the Duncan experiments, just thought, was able to predict something like E equal mc squared. Um, so the question well, is, uh, um, you know, what was in the brain of Einstein that made him uh, different from uh, from all of us, um, and how would it be possible to add circuits to our brain and make ourselves more intelligent, make ourselves able to solve problems like relativity? And there are many of them, not just relativity or, um, you know, teleportation. So these are the, the problems that fascinated me, understanding the brain. And um, this is, by the way, Einstein. And on the right is uh, an old friend of mine who died, Francis Crick, was mentioned before. On the left is David Marr, one of the founder, also a close friend, also died. Um, founder of Computation Neuroscience, which I'll describe in a second. Before doing that, um, I have to explain what it means to understand a system as complex as the brain. You know, what does it mean to understand an iPhone, like this one? Um, well, it, it means something different to different people. If you are a, a user or a software engineer, you want to understand the software of it, how it works in terms of commands to do speak or to send messages and so on. If you are an electrical engineer, you may want to understand how the transistors and the chips inside it work. If you are a computer scientist, like I am in part, you want to understand the algorithm for speech recognition, for instance, that, that Siri is using on the iPhone. And of course, the computer the brain is not a computer, but it is a computational machine. And, uh, and so um, we can understand the brain at different levels. We have to understand the brain at different levels. You have to understand it not only from the point of view of the genes in the neurons of the brain and the level of the connection between neurons and the general architecture of the brain, but also understand the algorithms and the strategies and the computation that the brain is doing in order to make us think and to make us perceive the world. And so, this is what computational neuroscience is um, occupying with, trying to understand how the brain produces the mind. And um, 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 uh, and if you want to understand the brain, you have to deal with um, quite a bit of complexity. You have here neurons, which are cells, which have um, 10,000 connections with uh, other cells, um, many more than, by the way, the transistors of the gates in systems like this, which have um, typically like three or four connections. Um, so I want to give um, a short example of work in computational neuroscience from my own work. It has to do with uh, visual cortex and visual part of visual cortex called the ventral stream, um, which is uh, uh, um, a further about of the cortex in our brain. Uh, yep, I have some. Um, bad behavior of the slides, but uh, you can see here the parts of the cortex, a wiring diagram of different areas from primary visual cortex 
back up. And uh, there are in, in our visual cortex about one billion neurons or so. Actually, this is uh, probably from one to 10 billion neurons. And uh, um, we are beginning to understand some of the algorithms or the strategies that a visual cortex is using. Um, and in fact, over the last 10 years or so, we have been able to, in my group, to uh, have a models that can um, replicate uh, many properties of neurons in these visual areas. Uh, this V1, by the way, is in the back of the head, and information goes for, come from to there, from the eye, and from there to the front of our brain, where more decision-dedicated uh, areas are located. And uh, um, this model can reproduce the recognition ability of humans under certain conditions for certain type of images. Um, but that, that has been quite interesting and uh, very useful to physiologists. But there was something quite intriguing that happened recently about it. And this, this is that we had a model that we could simulate on a computer um, completely. But we could not quite understand how it worked. It worked pretty well, better than, uh, for recognition, better than visual system built by engineers. But we couldn't really have, apart from a summon intuition, a good understanding of properties of it. Uh, it may be a general problem in, that we'll find in modeling the brain, that we'll have models that will work, but we don't, will not have a deep understanding of how to improve them or why they work as they do, under which conditions and so on. In this particular case, we have developed over the last 12 months a theory that it actually seems to explain quite a lot of why the model worked and maybe how visual cortex works. And um, the theory is very much in the spirit of physics. It starts from a, an assumption that the goal of the ventral stream is to learn during development. In the case of humans, when humans are baby, babies, and to learn how images of objects transform because of translation and scaling and rotation. And from that being variant to those transformations. Um, so that's the assumption that this is the computational goal of um, the ventral stream, or one of the computational goals. And then from this assumption, we are able to prove theorems um, that um, predict properties of neurons in visual cortex and also architecture. Here, for instance, is the prediction of how neurons in visual cortex should develop by being exposed to vision. And uh, um, below you see that similar uh, receptive fields, similar tuning of the neurons are found in actual experiments in which physiologists record from single neurons with uh, microelectrodes. Now, I, I, I don't have to, time to go into this, but uh, it's almost uh, too nice to be true, and it may well not be true, it's certainly quite exciting because it would be incredible if we could have in neuroscience a theory with uh, or theories with the elegance and the power of physics theory, starting essentially from symmetry properties, conservation properties, invariance properties to transformation, and ending up with describing fine details of properties of the neurons. Um, but let me finish with this, just to mention that um, I think that we are in a golden age for neuroscience and for artificial intelligence. Um, there have been uh, recent successes in artificial intelligence, especially because of machine learning, a field in which I've been working, how to um, learn from experience, how to make algorithms and computers learn from experience. And um, successes that come from this are things you probably know, they uh, range from uh, machines that can, can beat us at playing chess, like Deep Blue, 
to machines that can beat humans at Jeopardy, a question and answering TV game in America. This was Watson and IBM computers. To systems that are better than humans in finding articles or books like Google search. Um, uh, and, and so on. There are now systems, uh, there is a company here in Israel, Mobileye, producing a system that can will drive a car better than human drivers uh, based on vision uh, and so on and so forth. So we have machines that are able, that are as good as, our, as we are, as intelligent as we are in narrow domains of intelligence. We still don't have machines that are as intelligent or humanly intelligent as, intelligent as we are. And for achieving this goal, I think we'll need the combination of neuroscience and computer science. And this is what we have recently started at, at MIT um, under um, a, a name that we call the Intelligence Initiative, trying a multidisciplinary effort, trying to put together uh, neuroscientists, computer scientists, physicists, mathematicians, in trying to, uh, again, 50 years after artificial intelligence to make progress on this problem of what is intelligence and how to replicate intelligence in uh, machines. Thank you.